This is the place to see his output. The works are housed in some 40 restored buildings, like these artillery sheds left over from the Second World War, which contain a hundred gleaming aluminium boxes, their silver surfaces reflecting one another, the big sky and the flat landscape outside. It's a temple of aesthetic fanaticism. Minimal art completely rejected imagery. It avoided nature, although sometimes it could play very well against a landscape. Its materials were inorganic, steel, concrete, plastic, polished metal. It was impersonal, machined and assembled, not hand wrought. It denied the human body. It denied touch. It existed for the eye alone. And yet its denial of the sensuous was deeply American. You thought of the purity of Shaker furniture, of the spareness of Puritan meeting houses, boxes with God's word in them. Judd's work was hard to like because the purity he sought was of a kind that most people don't want in sculpture. No figure, no parts, no relationships, no movement, no metaphors, no secrets. Just the thing in itself and a completely inexpressive thing at that. None of which excluded the fact that it could be beautiful in an anxious utopian way. It's in the world, but it tells us nothing about the world. Everyone respected Judd's Puritanism, but they didn't want to be so exclusive about it. And yet, they too could be just as extreme. One such artist was Richard Serra, who wanted to find a way past the purity of minimalism by invoking the human body and its anxieties in weight, mass, and hard work with heavy materials. I thought that with my own hands that I could involve myself in a process of making that could confront minimalism and open up the field. And so basically I started very simply writing down a verb list and enacting physical processes in relation to the material I had at hand. To split, to cut, to sever, to drop, to remove, to simplify, to differ, to disarrange, to open, to mix, to splash, to knot, to spill, to droop, to flow. High minimalism could be ordered from a factory by phone, not Sarah's. He was a manual worker, intimately involved with the process of making and the logic of materials. He lifted sheets of rubber. He dumped arrays of metal on the floor. He spattered molten lead into corners. In the late 60s, you were throwing molten lead into a corner. I would have thought clearly the act of throwing liquid metal has some relation to Pollock's throwing of skeins of liquid paint on a canvas. Pollock was very important to you, wasn't he? It's very important in terms of the process and the final product being one in the same. And I think that, for me, broke more ground than the minimalist had. Basically, what I was trying to do was use the juncture of the wall and the floor, the architectural device, to make a sculpture. And then I would do that, and then I would uncrank it, turn it over, and pull it back. The fact that it was done by flinging the lead stylistically looks like Pollock. But when I was building those pieces, I certainly didn't have Pollock in mind. What he did have in mind was the weight of sculpture, its presence in the world, something to set against the abstraction of ideas. I'm excited right now. Richard Serra's massive sculptures are anxious monuments. You skirt them with respect. Nothing except gravity holds the tons of steel plate together. No welds, no bolts, no brackets. If it fell on you, it would squash you like a bug.
In the 1970s, the ambitions of American artists were large and space in Soho, in downtown New York, was cheap. The two came together when the sculptor Walter de Maria got the Deer Centre for the Arts to buy a second floor loft on Worcester Street. One of the hopes of minimalists and conceptual artists was to make works of art that could somehow transcend the art market while demanding more and more space from museums and galleries. Here, de Maria did both. He turned the loft into a low-key pilgrimage centre by filling it with 125 tonnes of deep, rich, chocolate-coloured soil, covering 3,600 square feet of prime real estate in perpetuity to a depth of 22 inches. A gallery full of earth. In the 1970s, some artists wanted to inscribe their designs on the earth itself. A classic of land art was created by Robert Smithson on the edge of the Great Salt Lake in Utah in 1970. He moved 10,000 tons of rock, dumping it into the red water to make what he called the spiral jetty. He meant his jetty as a tribute to prehistoric works of earth art. From the air, it resembled a spiral nebula in outer space. Smithson knew it would sink back into the lake. He was fascinated by entropy, the way that systems run down and fall apart. If the land could be the surface of art, so could the body. In his film piece, Art Makeup, Bruce Nauman smeared himself with paint, but not for pleasure. Pleasure is Nauman's enemy. In terms of his effects on younger artists over the last 15 or 20 years, Bruce Nauman has some claim to be called the most influential artist in America, even though you seldom get anybody claiming to actually enjoy his work. It explores whatever could turn you off. Aggro, torpor, bad jokes, paranoia, and boredom, especially boredom. The artist as hero may have vanished from American life, but Nauman has carved himself out a different kind of niche, the artist as nuisance. This piece, Carousel, is grossly disagreeable. It gives you a glimpse of hell with moulds of deer and wolves the plastic moulds used by taxidermists going slowly round to the amplified scraping noise they make while dragging on the floor. I'll talk. They'll listen. I'll talk. They'll talk. listen. I'll You'll talk, they'll listen. In a recent video piece, Nauman explores the way we communicate with each other, or don't. I'll talk to you. They'll listen to me. Go. Bernard, take two. You'll talk to me. You'll you. talk to them. They'll listen to you. Nauman is something of an old-fashioned moralist, and this comes out in a certain bossiness. His work sends messages about behavior and how it's controlled by others. It can get quite sinister. Put your hands in your lap, your hat on your head. Sit on your hat, your hands on your head. The image of a mime obeys the orders of a calm, disembodied voice, the outer parent. The orders get more and more confusing, more and more humiliating. Shit in your hat. Show me your hat. Put your hat on your head. Do you feel the anxiety in your work mirrors a more general kind of anxiety in America itself? Probably. I know that Ed Kingholtz once said to me, don't you think it's just a great time to be an artist because you can just do anything and people will accept it. And, and, and I think that kind of open 
possibility, it, it's, it's confusing because you don't know exactly what you're supposed to do then. And, uh, and I think the whole culture has become a little open like that. And so people are very anxious because they don't know what the rules are anymore. But as body art, video, conceptual art and process took over the 70s, what had become of abstract painting once the glory of the New York school? Great class.